Hello and welcome to the Mindful Men podcast, the show helping men to open up about manhood. My name is Simon Rennie and my aim is to get men talking. From mental health to fatherhood and everything in between, Mindful Men creates a safe space for conversation. Now, before we get into this episode, I want to say a huge thank you for joining me. It means a world for you to join me and talk about men's issues. And if you love what you hear, please subscribe and share the episode with your mates. You can also join the conversation on Instagram and YouTube, and I'd love to connect with you there. But for now, sit back, relax, and let's get mindful. G'day, guys, and welcome to another episode of the Mindful Men podcast. I'm your host, Simon Rinney, and today we're getting mindful about fatherhood and family. And helping me out with this conversation, I've got Brian Ward from California. How are you going, Brian? How you doing, my friend? Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. I was looking forward to this. Thanks for taking some time out of your Sunday to join me. I'm really excited to have this chat with you today. And I was fortunate enough to be on the Dad Up podcast myself. So I'm really looking forward to reconnecting after a few weeks. But Brian, to introduce you, you're a husband and father, a Marine Corps veteran, a podcast creator and host, a speaker, a championship basketball coach, which I'm keen to explore today. And a skydiver. That's quite a CV you've got yeah. there. Tell yeah. me about skydiving. Yeah. How did skydiving come into your life? <laughs> it's always been a uh, bucket list thing. Uh, something that I've always wanted to do. Uh, I'm not a uh, I'm not a person that's scared of heights. Um, that kind of stuff doesn't scare me. Uh, it's just the rush, the thrill of trying it. And my wife uh, surprised me a few years back for a birthday present and. I did it. And I have to tell you, it's like the second I hit the ground, I couldn't wait to go back up. Um, So uh, I was able to uh, convince my wife to do it herself. Uh, So she, she went ahead and tried it and uh, she loved it. And so we're, we're looking at possibly doing a jump together uh, next February on Valentine's day to just kind (laughs) of do a jump together. Um, But it's really, It's really cool because, you know, I'm in California, so right along the coast, I do it down in in lower California, it's called a city called Oceanside, and it it just overlooks the ocean, and it's just, I mean, it's it's an insane feeling. I mean, the second, uh, I have to tell you, I was not scared, I was super excited until I hit that door. (laughs) <laughs> and right when you hit the door and you realize you're about to go out, that's where, that's when kind of the, the nerves get you, but it only lasts. I, I explained to people that it only lasts for a few seconds because once you're out of the plane, no joke, it does not feel like you are falling. I mean, you're free falling at a couple hundred miles an hour. It does not feel like you're falling. It just doesn't. It feels like you're flying. And then, you know, they open the chute and you just kind of coast down and, and float down. Uh, it's just just an insane feeling. I highly recommend it. Even if you're scared of heights, it's it's just a, it's just a great, great thrill. So a great experience. I'm absolutely petrified of heights. And <laughs> so, so just looking well, out the window of a plane can get me sometimes. My dad said to me, he's like, why in the world would you jump out of a perfectly good plane? Why would you do that? <laughs> yeah, I know. It's just, it's a lot of fun. I hear that a lot. Like a lot of people, like even the people that are scared of heights, that once they do get out there and, and they feel like that floating or flying sensation that you're talking about, and then they hit the ground and it is something that is pretty amazing. So it is on my bucket list. I just don't know how high up my bucket list it is. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, it's something that I just, I look forward to doing and, and can't wait for my wife and I to go together. Yeah, wonderful. I'm trying to talk my kids into doing it. They just, they won't have it. You know, my boys are, my son, my older son will turn uh, 24 on Tuesday. My younger son's 21. I'm like, look, guys, you guys can do it. And they're like, nope, not even, (laughs) not even going that route. We'll watch you and we'll sit there and wave at you when you're in the air, but we are not doing that. (laughs) I'm surprised because the younger fellas usually like to do that type of stuff. Right. You think, yeah, my son, my son owns a really fast car, you know, he's into that kind of that thrill kind of yeah he has no no desire to do that (laughs) (laughs) maybe one day when their bucket list starts to grow as well so um now brian i love to start off and hearing a bit about your backstory and and like you know you said that you live in california like so tell us about where you grew up and what it was like growing up and and some of those i guess key life events that stick out for you 
Well, thank you for asking that. Yeah, I'm I'm born and raised California kid. Um, grew up in a family that you know I have a younger sister, and uh, enjoyed the beach life. You know, I was one of those kids that played sports, and then weekends I was hitting the ocean. I was surfing. You know, I just did the normal California kid stuff. You know, um, but I also grew up in a family that my parents both were blue collar workers. They worked long hours and, uh, you know, I guess they, I could say that they were basically a paycheck to paycheck family. And my parents could not afford time away from work to participate in the stuff that I was doing as a kid, whether it was sports, going to school events, open houses, parent teacher conferences, um, things like that. They just couldn't uh, get out of work to do those things. And that affected me as a kid. Uh, and I knew that, uh, I knew that when I looked up in the stands, I wasn't looking at my parents in the stands. I was seeing other kids on the teams and their families and their parents. And, and that did impact me. I remember that. Uh, and I knew back then growing up that I didn't want to be that way as a dad myself. I mean, I used to ride to practices and games with my friend's parents because I didn't have a ride. And so I just knew that when I had kids when I was older and had kids, I wanted to make sure that I was involved in their life as much as possible. And I got out of the got out of high school and went right into the military, um, four year career in the United States Marine Corps. I did that to kind of give me a chance to get away from home a little bit, um, mm -hmm. help me grow up, help me mature, um, learn responsibility uh, because I lived at home until I was you know eighteen, and I just wanted to kind of be out on my own, and I didn't know how else to do it. I, I knew that college, if I went to college, I would be going to college, but I would still be living at home. And I was really scared of what my future would hold because I didn't know what I wanted to do for a living. And at 18, I mean, some 18 year olds do, but you know, a lot of them don't, they're not sure what they want to do with their lives. And I just got nervous that I was going to be stuck in kind of this rut of living where I was living, not really having a, a vision of what I could do for myself. And so the military felt like a good way to kind of help me grow up. And I'm very proud of the fact that I served. I had a good time, taught me a lot of responsibilities and work ethic and all that stuff. Um, and when I decided to get out of the military, I got a job right in banking, doing automobile loans. And I actually have been there ever since. I've been there over 25 years. And now I'm a manager of one of the largest departments in the bank. And it's been a, been a great career. When I did get out of the military, I did go to school. So I did go back to college, I got mm -hmm. my degree. Uh, and fortunately for me, uh, I don't have any college debt. Uh, the, the military paid for my schooling. So free tuition, all that stuff. So the GI Bill is one of the greatest things that they have out there for military men and women. And it was that time that I was going to school and working at this bank that uh, you know my wife and I got married, started having kids. And I got into coaching because my mm -hmm. older son was four and wanted to play sports. And I thought as a parent, I want to be involved as much as possible. And I'm going to be there watching, taking him to practices and watching his practices and his games. So I might as well get involved. So I took on the role of head coach uh, mm -hmm. for a four-year-old little league team that I knew <laughs> nothing. I mean, I knew baseball because he wanted to play baseball. So I knew everything about baseball, but I didn't know how, a clue how to coach. And I remember taking my son to sign him up for Little League. And the, the guy that was at the table said, hey, do you want to coach? And I said, yeah, I do. I want to, I want to help out. And he goes, do you want a head coach? And I said, no, 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 no. I don't want a head. I don't want to be the head coach. <laughs> and he's like, look, we need head coaches, man. We're like short. We need head coaches. I'm like, dude, I don't know how to coach little kids. I need to watch first and learn and then I'll do it. And he said, they're four years old, <laughs> teach them how to hit, teach them how to throw and teach them how to run the bases. Trust me, most of the time they're going to be pulling grass and chasing, you know, bugs and everything else. So don't worry about it. They're four. So I did. <laughs> so I took on the role. Um, and I have to tell you something, I mean, I can remember the very first game that we drove to how nervous I was my very first game as a head coach. <laughs> um, but it was a lot of fun and I, and I don't regret it. I coached for over 20 years. Um, from, from four years old, my kids were four years old, all the way up through high school. Um, I coached and, uh, the later years it was basketball. And mm -hmm. so I coached a lot of basketball the last 10 years. And that's what I coached in, at the high school level, uh, was varsity basketball. And it was a lot of fun. Uh, it gave me a chance to really bond with my boys. 
really grow that relationship with them and spend a lot of time with them. And then once my younger son, who's now a junior in college, once he was in his senior year of high school, I kind of had this feeling that my dad role, my dad journey was ending. Even though we know it doesn't, we'll always be a dad. But I felt like my wife and I had done our jobs of raising two independent young men that are responsible and mature. Uh, so what's next for me? Uh, and I didn't know how to fulfill that dad duty. And that's how I came up with the podcast. It was uh, something that I could do to help other men kind of give them tips and tools and strategies to really be a dad that they want to be. A lot of dads carry weight of, you know, feeling like they have to be working these 80 hour weeks to provide them for their family. And they miss out on a lot of events and things that go on with their kids. And I'm here to tell you, did it myself. I let, I, I have a very successful career and I was still hundred percent all in as a dad. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, just, just showing dads that, yeah, it's possible to have a very successful career and whatever it is you're doing and still be an all in dad. Um, and so that's why I started the podcast and the podcast is, you know, about 162 episodes in now, um, going for over three years, uh, a show every week. It's an amazing story. And it's something that when I think about, you know, your the reason like that you wanted to be present for your kids and coach the, the baseball team and then the basketball team is something that I've been actively thinking about as my kids. You know, I've got a five-year-old and, and an almost three-year-old. She's three in a few weeks. And that's something that's front of mind for me and front and center of mind is that I want to be there for the sports and I want to be there for the pickups and, and the school nights and the parent teacher interviews. It's really important for me, I guess, because, because in, in some ways, like my parents were around a lot when I was a kid, but also they did work a lot as well. So dad would drop me off maybe an hour before footy practice. And I'd sit at the oval by myself, maybe with my little brother, if we had training that night. And he'd got run off to work, his second job. So this wasn't his first job, this was his second job. And then there'll be other times on the weekends when he couldn't come or mum couldn't come for work as well, where we would be hitching a ride with other families too and, and, and going to games as well. And, and they got there as much as they could, but yeah, sometimes they couldn't. And, and you do feel that as a child, like looking out to the stands or to the side of the oval or whatever and, and th wishing that they were there to, to sit, you know, cheer you on and all that type of stuff. Sometimes I physically couldn't be there because I had three brothers as well. So we had a lot of sport happening in different parts of where I grew up as well. So I understood that as well. I wasn't the only boy in the family, um, but I can certainly understand, you know, those feelings inside, um, particularly for me as a, as a young dad, wanting to be as present as possible for my kids. But I want to ask you, like, you know, what does it mean to you to be a dad? Um, we've all got different ideas of what fatherhood means and looks like for us. Can you think back to that day one of becoming a father and, and what it felt like and then what it means today as well? You know, as, as you probably heard, I take my, my dad responsibilities and role very seriously. And for me, when I became a dad for the first time, um, you know, we had a very scary situation uh, with my wife and my son when he was born. My wife had something called preeclampsia. Uh, where she, her blood pressure raises pretty significantly when she was pregnant with my first son. Uh, and he was actually born six and a half weeks premature. Uh, oh, wow. They had to take the baby. Uh, and when he was born, he was under six pounds. His body was so small and underdeveloped that he had one lung that was collapsed. And so he couldn't function on his own. So they were having to breathe for him. They had to put a little thing over his face and, and help him breathe. Uh, and he was in the NICU uh, the neonatal intensive care unit uh, for two and a half weeks. And he was on a, what is called an oscillator. It's basically a ventilator for babies. And so that was a pretty traumatic time for my wife and I having our first child and going through this experience. Like we didn't know what to do. We were kind of lost and, and struggled with that. But, you know, my son was a strong young baby. He came off just fine. Uh, he was done in the NICU after two and a half weeks and came home. A lot of parents get to experience that time of, you know, being in the hospital for a day or two and then taking their child home. And we didn't get to, um, we had to go home at night and go to wow. bed without our child, our child being stuck in the hospital. And it was a, it was very, very tough on more so on my wife. I mean, I understood it more, but I felt for her 
And I was sad that we didn't have him there, but my wife took it really hard. She would live at the hospital. I mean, first thing in the morning, she was there when they opened the doors to the NICU so she could spend time with him. And she was there until they closed the doors at night and kicked her out. And she did that for two and a half weeks. That experience was very tough, but it made it that much more special. when We did get to bring him home because, you know, he was born on November 29th. And so when he came home like a week and a half before Christmas, it made it that, that his first Christmas that much more special. And then with my younger son, he was on the different side of the spectrum. He was a big boy when he was born, but he was actually born two weeks premature, but he was fully developed. He was almost 10 pounds when he was born, but we had an episode with him where uh, my wife, after giving birth, she was in her recovery room and she started hemorrhaging. And she had uh, started losing a lot of blood and they rushed me out of the room, uh, told me to wait outside. I just see a flurry of doctors go running into her room to care for her. And then the next moment I see her head doctor is straddling her on her bed, hooking up all these different machines and things to her. She's unconscious. And they're rolling her out of the room and, and shooing her down the hallway on her bed. And I'm left there like, what in the world is going on? And so they took me back to her regular room and told me to wait there. And so I'm sitting there with family and stuff going, what is going on? So that was, that was just kind of flip side of things. She, uh, her doctor came into me a short time later and said, uh, Brian, I have to tell you something. We were seconds away from losing her she almost died. And that was, uh, that hit me like a ton of bricks. They saved her. She lost enough blood for two people. Mm -hmm. uh, she was on a dialysis machine. They had her, uh, in a medically induced coma and she was like that for, um, about a week and a half. She was in the ICU and they kept her on that, in, in that coma. They wanted to make sure that her organs were still working. They wanted to make sure her brain was still functioning, her nerves and all that kind of stuff were still working well. And she recovered from that pretty remarkably. But the funny thing about that is that here I am sitting in uh, the hospital day in and day out. I have my son who's in the neonatal unit and the doctor came and told me and said, look, your, your baby can go home now. We can't keep your baby. He's healthy. He's fine. Mm -hmm. um, obviously your wife has to stay. And I said, I don't want to take him home yet because I want to stay here with my wife. And they ended up letting me keep the baby, keep my son in the natal unit unit for another few days. Um, and then I finally had to bring him home. And it was very odd because there I was, usually it's my wife sitting in the wheelchair, you know, carrying the baby out as we roll out to the car. And this time it was me sitting in the wheelchair, yeah. holding the baby as the nurse was wheeling me out to the car so I could take my baby home. And my wife is still in the ICU unit recovering. After about a week and a half, two weeks, she was home um, and doing well. You know, she's been fine ever since, but that was a very scary moment for both of us, uh, for both our boys um, yeah. to go through that. So the reason I tell you those two stories is because that's what makes my fatherhood journey so special um, mm. is that I have a very special connection with these two guys and how they came into this world uh, in very uh, opposite ends of the spectrum and how they came in. Um, but the fact that I knew the kind of dad that I was going to be and knowing the experiences that they went through when they were born, it just made my dad role that much greater for me personally. Yeah. What it, what it means to be a dad is I'm, I'm looking at these two men as gifts from God, you know, for people out there that are religious, I believe in my heavenly father and he's given me these gifts to raise for him. And I take that role very seriously. So these two boys are, are two of my best friends now. I mean, we've had our moments, we've had our, you know, our head butting moments. Um, but they're two of my best friends and they're two guys that, that I would go to the ends of the earth for. So that's what, uh, that's what fatherhood means to me. Yeah. Wow. But they won't jump out of a plane with you. They won't. <laughs> there's, there's two things they draw the line at jumping out of a plane and joining the military. Those are the two things that I've really tried to encourage them to do. And neither one of those, I can't commit. 
convince them to do it. <laughs> <laughs> what are two birth stories? Um, just crazy. Like the whole birthing process is hugely daunting, particularly if you haven't grown up with babies around you. Like I remember when uh, we had our first, our boy, our son, Gus, it turned from a, a natural birth into an emergency Caesar. And, and then at the end of that, my wife was in bed, but I was standing there with Gus and, and I'm like, now what do I do? <laughs> like, how do I do this? And, and it's hugely, um, it's daunting and it's scary. And I remember crying that first night, just being completely overwhelmed and not sure how to change a nappy and all that. But you've got like extreme, like children in, in incubators, were, were they? Were, you, were the boys in incubators? I mean, my older son was, he was in an incubator for a short period of time. And then he went to a, like a little, I mean, I have a picture of him sitting in his little bed and just all these machines hooked up to him. I mean, he, I mean, they had to do an IV in his forehead because they couldn't get the IV in his arms because yeah. his veins were so small. They had to find one in his forehead. So he had his IV sticking in his forehead and he had tape over his mouth to help him breathe for the oscillator. It's a pretty, pretty gruesome thing to look at, but, you know, talking about the stuff that we went through, you know, giving giving birth to both of our boys, you know, that's not, you know, I don't want people to get scared if you're listening to this or watching mm. this and you're pregnant. Um, I don't want you to get frightened because medical technology and, and the expertise of the doctors is phenomenal. Um, so trust the process and just, just have faith in God and faith in the doctors and the surgeons that they know what they're doing. If you do go through something, those instances are very small, uh, remote chance that it happens. But if it happens, just give your faith up to God and, and trust that the, that the doctors and the medicine that they give them and help them with is will help. So um, mm. I just want to put that little uh, disclaimer in there. Yeah, absolutely. I remember when we scrubbed up and we went up to the emergency room for Gus, like I just felt confident that we were in the right place. We had the right people around us that could obviously help us through that process. And, and he turned out, well, I'm yet to decide if he turned out all right, but he, he turned out pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny that you say, um, you know, you, you didn't know what to do because most dads don't, right? Mm. I, they say that uh, that in school, you're given a lesson and then you take the test. Well, when you when you have a child, you're given the test, which is that child, and then you, and then you get the lesson, which is how to take care of them, right? So <laughs> yeah. it's kind of backwards when you have a child, but you know, there's so many different things like the podcasts and, and books. And I mean, there's so many different things online. And, and a lot of it comes from not only how you were raised or the experiences that you went through, but the people that you know. Uh, mm. I had a huge support system around me with my wife's family. They were all very close to her, very close to us and very close by. So even though my, my son was in the NICU for two and a half weeks, uh, we were there with him. Her whole family was there um, spending time with us. When my wife was in the ICU, I spent a lot of time hanging out with her mom and she, she was there constantly um, supporting me and encouraging me. And, and so the support system around you is, is, is something that you should take advantage of, whether it's family or friends. Absolutely. Did you do much reading up about how to be a parent before the bubs come along? No, I read a couple of books, uh, but I felt like, you know, the books were, uh, I got some info out of them, but I just felt like it was kind of one of those things where you just have to jump into. It's like kind of like jumping out of a plane, right? <laughs> you don't really know how to do it. You just got to kind of follow what the instructor says and 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 hope for the best. Uh, that's kind of the way. <laughs> Perfect parent, analogy of being a parent. <laughs> right. That's kind of the way it is with parenting. You just kind of, you know, follow the experiences that you had and the people around you that give you advice or tips or tools or strategies or whatever, or podcasts, and then hope for the best. Hope that you do a good job. As parents, we're going to fail. We're going to stumble. I stumble all the time. I, I mean, you'd think I'm a... I consider myself not a uh, licensed therapist, but I consider myself an expert dad. And even as an expert dad, I still stumble. I still stub mm. my toe constantly with my boys. So you just uh, you just have to uh, learn to grow from it and know that uh, if you make a mistake, own it and move on. Now, you're a bit further along your parenting journey than I am. And I always hear about the teenage years. I, I've I've obviously experienced the teenage years as a teenager, but my kids are, are way off that. Talk us through some of the teenage years. Did you have a lot of challenges there with the boys or, or was that an easy period for you? Yeah, no, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, 
the teenage years are interesting because I find that the teenage years are, um, well, even, even right before the teenage years, your kids are starting to really discover who they are, right? Mm -hmm. They're trying to figure out who they want to be, who they are as a person, trying to figure out their identity, trying to learn different things still about maturity and about growing up, taking on responsibilities, whether it's chores and all that. But when the teenage years come, they're still kind of in that phase of trying to figure out who they are, but now the independence kicks in. Now they want to be even more independent. So parents, when you're dropping your kids off at school and you're used to giving them a hug, goodbye or whatever, that may stop. That could very well, I'm probably pretty confident that's going to stop. The kids don't want to have anything to do with you they, because here's the thing, don't take it personally. They just want to be independent. They want to show that they're responsible. They can handle things on their own. So when my boys were teenagers, they were not my best friends. I, they didn't want to have anything to do with me. Now I was a coach on their team. So I still had to see them constantly and they respected me as a coach. But when it came to being dad, they wanted nothing to do with me. They wanted to be the, themselves. They wanted to hang out with their friends. They wanted to be responsible and do their own thing. They didn't want to do what I was doing. And that's okay. I allowed them that opportunity to be independent and learn who they are and kind of grow into their own personalities and, and styles, pick up their own habits and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. So the teenage years are tough because that's what they're trying to do. And the more you hold them back from doing that, the harder of a relationship you're going to have with your child when they start to hit those adolescent years, when they start to become an adult, because then they're going to really need to lean on you for a lot of additional support. And if they don't have that bond with you, that connection, because you really forced yourself on them through their teenage years, um, you're going to lose it when they're an adult. They're just not going to rely on you or look to you. And for my boys, you know, we let them be boys. You know, we let them do what they wanted to do as long as they were being responsible, as long as they weren't doing anything illegal or unethical or anything like that. We really kind of let them be them. And the one thing that I would encourage you as parents to do, though, is these devices, these electronic devices, whether it's a computer or their cell phones or whatever. I do highly encourage the, you know, at least some monitoring of those to make sure they're not getting into things they shouldn't be. Uh, the other thing is that I always did with my boys when they were teenagers, I always knew the friends that they were hanging out with. Yeah. And I always knew the parents of the friends they were hanging out with because the parents will tell you a lot about the kids they are hanging out with. So yeah, those two things I did a lot as a parent, but other than that, I let them be boys and uh, trust me, parents, when they hit the 18, 19 year old age, they come back around. I have heard that <laughs> they come back around. And it's all about, as you said, it's all about that relationship you build at the younger years as well, so that they feel safe to come back um, and, and re-engage mm -hmm. and, and so forth. What was it like, you know, coaching, but also trying to be a dad at the same time and, and wearing, I guess, two different hats? And how did you navigate that? My kids understood from a very early age that when we're on the field or on the basketball court, um, I was coach. And that's how they responded to me as coach. They didn't respond to me as dad. That was a hard line I drew in the sand in the very beginning. So because I raised them that way from when they were four all the way up, uh, they were used to it. By the time they hit the teenage years or even into high school, they were used to it. It was just natural. Now, when we got in the car and we were on our way home from practice or games, my dad hat would go back on. And sometimes there were cases where I'd say, do you want the dad advice or do you want the dad input or do you want the coach's input? And they would tell me, I really need to hear from coach right now. And I'd give mm. them coaching advice. So I kept those things separate. Don't get me wrong. As a coach, when your son's out on the court and he's playing as a dad, you want him to play well. You don't want him to mess up, you know, because that's your boy, right? Or that's your daughter. Um, you don't want him to mess up. But I still played with it from the mindset of I'm a coach. I'll give you one experience. I was, a, uh, I was the associate head coach on the boys varsity basketball team. And we were coming into halftime and the game was, was tied. We were getting our butts handed to us and the game ended up being tied right at halftime. And my son wasn't one of the players on the court at the time we went into halftime. And at the end of the half, the head coach comes over to me and says, Brian, who do you want to go with for the starting five for the next half? And I said, you got to go with the same guys we just had in because they were playing really well. We got back in this game. Mm -hmm. And he's like, all right, that's what we'll do. Well, my son wasn't in that, that, that five, that group of five, yeah. he wasn't in there because I separated that role as dad. I could have said very easily. Yeah. I think, I think Brett should go back in. I, I think he should, he needs to get a chance to get in there because that's not the role. My role is not to put my son in if, you know, if the other guys are performing better. 
So I kept those roles uh, separate. I saw too many other coaches that really put their kids above everybody else. Mm. And it's not fair to the rest of the players. It's not fair to the parents. Um, and it just sends a wrong message. And I didn't want my kid, it was really for my sons. I didn't want them to take the brunt of all the players giving them a hard time because their dad's a coach. Um, that yeah. was really the main reason why I didn't do it. It wasn't hard for me. Um, a lot of dads struggle that. It wasn't hard for me at all. Yeah, yeah, no, it's really um, a great way to look at it. I've, I've played with players who their dads were the coaches of, of some of the football teams that I grew up playing with. And yeah, you can certainly see when when they're on the field, it's definitely coach. And, and when they're off the field, it becomes dad. And it's a great separation to to build that respect as well and, and trust. And um, But not just with, with your boy or your daughter or, or whoever, but it's also the whole team as well. It's a great way to, I guess, look at sport and family mixed in at the same time. I'd love to hear a bit more about your wife. Now, it's Andrea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, tell me, so like, how did you meet? And was she with you when you were in the Marine Corps? Yeah, so we met through mutual friends. Uh, and it's a funny story. I had just gotten back from Okinawa. I'd spent time in Japan uh, mm -hmm. on tour. And I had a uh, one of my best friends, his wife. Um, I hadn't seen her in a good year, year and a half. And she wanted to come by and say hi, because I had just gotten back. And she said, hey, I have somebody I want you to meet. Can I bring her along? And I said, yeah, sure. So she shows up and I met, you know, my friend's wife. I said hello to her. And then I look over at now my wife and I, I cannot believe I said this, but I looked at her and I said, who the hell are you? <laughs> was, so that was my first words to my wife. Who the hell are you? And now she's my wife. <laughs> um, it's funny. She tells a story that, you know, after they left, you know, my buddy's wife asked her, you know, what'd you think of Brian? And she said, oh, he's cute, but he's kind of a jerk. <laughs> and, you know, I don't know if it was just immaturity or just, you know, I was a Marine Corps, I was a Marine, you know, that kind of thing, hard, hard headed. I don't know. Um, but, you know, we, we went out on a date and kind of the rest was history, man. We, uh, we really hit it off. She's, she's, she's funny. She's, she's beautiful. She's super smart. I mean, I cannot believe how smart this lady is. Uh, and she's, she's a phenomenal mom. She's an unbelievable mm. mom. Um, I wish that we could have uh, had more kids because um, she's just, she's just an incredible mom. Um, but it's just, uh, it's just a relationship that we have, uh, we have continued to foster and grow. And I couldn't see, honestly, I couldn't see my life without her. I mean, she's just, she's my best friend. We have now been married uh, over 25 years. You know, uh, married couples, they think that marriage should be smooth sailing for the most part. And, you know, it's not the case. You have to work at it. It's like constantly dating. You have to constantly mm. do that in order to make sure your relationship is healthy. And we're constantly, we go out on dates all the time. We, we do things together constantly. And we even see a marriage coach. We have a marriage coach that we meet with at least once a month. Sometimes it's a month, every month and a half or so. Right now we're seeing her every couple of weeks because we just want to make sure we're still staying on mm -hmm. top of our you know, commitment to each other and working on things that we need to work on with our communication and all that stuff. Um, we don't see a marriage coach because we have problems. We see a marriage coach so we don't have problems. It's just something that we really enjoy. The marriage coach is a, she's a licensed, you know, marriage therapist, but you know, she's our coach and, and um, we enjoy meeting with her. Um, it helps us stay committed to each other and it helps us continue to work on our relationship. I mean, that's something that's super important, especially going, you know, working on year number 26, you know, it's super, super important for us. And it's important for our boys to see that too, just raising our boys and seeing the relationship that we have with each other sends the message to them of what kind of relationships they should have with their wives. But don't get me wrong. We've had our moments. We've had our times where we just were not getting along and we've butted heads and we've gotten into arguments and things like that. That's going to happen when you live with somebody 20, basically 24 seven, you know, it's going to happen, but learning how to navigate through that is what's important. And she and I, I think for the most part, we've done a pretty remarkable job at that. And yeah, just hearing the birth stories in themselves, it sounds like she's a remarkably strong woman. Oh, super. Yeah. Just to get through that and, and, and persevere and, and yeah, like almost to be thinking about jumping out of a plane with you for Valentine's day next year. What is it about Andrea that makes you a better, I guess, husband and father and person? Um, she's super supportive in everything that I do. As a coach, you know, I coached sports for over 20 years. And when you're a coach and you're married, we consider our wives uh, coaches' widows. 
<laughs> mm. because they're, you know, they're home at night, you know, when we're off running practices or games, you know, they're sitting at home and um, she always supported me every single time, you know, every year when, when a sport came up or a team came up that I was going to coach, she was super supportive. I continued coaching even after my boys were out of high school. I still stayed at the high school level coaching and uh, she would still come to games and watch, even though her boys weren't playing, she would just come there and support me. So she has been super supportive and she has also helped me learn how to be a dad. Being a Marine Corps veteran, uh, I have kind of a, a temper uh, through the years and she's helped me kind of keep that in, in check and under control. So there's times when I've you know gotten frustrated or about to lose it. And she'd tell me, she'd push me aside and say, let me take this. You go, get, you go take a breather. Um, so she supported me in that way. And then the other way is when I came out of the Marines, I, I drank pretty heavily. Uh, I was a drinker and mm -hmm. I drank through a lot of our marriage, um, growing up with my boys, even though I was coaching and all that, I didn't, I wasn't an alcoholic in the sense that I would show up to practices or games with alcohol on my breath. I didn't do that kind of stuff, but I was the at home drinker. So when I came home, I was drinking a lot. And she helped me. She told me that, uh, hey, you know, I think you need to cool it with this stuff. And she helped me quit drinking. And I've been sober now for over 13 years. So wow. um, it's something that I did for her and for our family. Um, but she's helped me grow a lot as a dad, as a person um, in the different avenues that I've gone down, whether it's coaching or the podcast. She's super supportive. I mean, she gives me a lot of the questions for my guests. When I tell her the guests I'm going to have on, she'll, she'll, she'll tell me, oh, you need to ask this or you need to ask that. She's so supportive. She's, she's incredible. That's amazing. And that support is just, it's fundamental to everything. We, all of our, I guess, chasing our dreams and so forth. Like we often, when we finish school and we become parents and adults, we kind of lose track of those big dreams and we don't really pursue anything because we just fall into autopilot groundhog day kind of mode. So it's wonderful mm -hmm. that she's there in your corner helping you follow these dreams and helping dads all over the world, um, you know, through your podcast, for example, to, I guess, better themselves in their parenting journey or understand themselves a bit more. And, and that's an amazing thing for that support. And my, my wife, Rachel, she's um, supporting me through Mindful Men and, and developing my business as well. And I would have never been in this space. I would have been stuck in my nine to five um, that I was working previously without her support. So I guess having, as you're saying, having a good, solid communication and supportive relationship with each other to the point where you're in coaching to avoid being in those bad times um that's something that a lot of guys can really take some some value out of and, and thanks so much for sharing that about her yeah it's if i could give any piece of advice if you have some spare time whether it's an hour or whatever a month take some time and, and look for a, a marriage therapist. Uh, trust me, just having that person to go talk to, you know, sometimes we sit in these sessions and we don't have anything to talk about. She'll ask us what's been going on, what's happening. She'll ask us questions and we just have really nothing to talk about, but that's okay. But there are plenty of times where she'll help us through different conversations that we had or things, little, little disputes that we got into or little arguments that we might've had, nothing major, you know, you know, you guys out there watching, if you're married and you're not doing some type of coaching with your spouse. Um, I highly recommend it. It's super healthy, super natural, and it'll just help you guys last longer together in a healthy, loving relationship. Yeah, I had an episode <clears throat> with Bart Walsh. He's the head fitness coach of Jets Fitness Australia. And, and he was talking about the value of coaches in our lives. You know, we, we grow up and we've got a lot of coaches in our lives. We've got mm -hmm. teachers, we've got parents, we've got sports coaches. Maybe it's even like people like art tutors or music tutors. But then when we become adults, we kind of lose all that. And he, he said, it's great to have different types of coaches in your life to keep that you know, growth going and, and someone to bounce ideas off. And, you know, a therapist or a relationship coach or, or mental health person or, or anything like that is a great way to, to bounce ideas off as we get older because we shouldn't have to do it on our own just because we're adults think about um professional athletes professional athletes are paid millions of dollars because they're talented in the sport that they play right but guess what they have coaches tiger mm. woods is one of the greatest golfers of all time but guess what he still had a coach he had a coach to help him. When we go to the gym and we want to get into shape, we don't know what we're doing. We hire a trainer. We hire a coach. So why not have a coach in our marriage? Yeah, we don't definitely. know what we're doing. We're going through the you know going through the motions as a couple. So we have a coach that helps us do that.
Yeah, I love it. I love it. Um, now, I'd love to touch on Dad Up podcast as well because it is a, an amazing resource that's available worldwide. And I'm, I've been lucky enough to be a guest on on the show and, and talk about my mental health journey. Um, and you talked a bit about why you wanted to to start the podcast a few years ago now. With all the conversations that you've had with guys all over the world, what's some of the, I guess, the common themes that are coming up with things that dads or guys are struggling with from your perspective? Is there something that keeps coming up time and time again? Yeah, it's time. Uh, time with our kids. Um, mm. I hear dads say it a lot that kids spell love, T-I-M-E, not L-O-V-E. Yeah. Um, and spending time with your kids is super important and it's and it's intentional time. It's not, uh, you know, you're, you're goofing around on your phone while you're, you know, watching your son play soccer or something like that. It's, it's being intentional with the time that you have with your kids because believe it or not, and I know everybody that's hearing this or watching this has heard this before, but our kids grow up so fast. And it goes by so fast. My son's about to be 24 years old on Tuesday. And I can remember when he was born. I mean, I was just telling you the story of how he was born. Um, so that seems like it was just yesterday. When my boys were in high school, and I can remember them going to, as a freshman in high school, that dropping them off and watching them walk away to go to class or go to their first high school. Um, and knowing that now my son's not only out of high school, but out of college and now working in a career. Now my younger son's already a junior in college. It's just crazy how fast the time goes. And if you're not being intentional with your time with your kids, you're going to regret it. And the one thing as a dad that I don't want to regret when I'm laying on, on my bed about to go meet my heavenly father, I don't want to have any regrets. I don't want to have any regrets of things that I missed out on. I know too many dads that are so consumed with career and making money that they missed special moments, whether it's games. Let's say you missed a game for a meeting or, or a sale you needed to make. And it was that one game that your son or daughter played their very best and scored so many points or did something phenomenal like ESPN highlight kind of moment, right? And you missed it because you were more worried about making this sale and making this money. Don't get me wrong, making money for your family is important and you have to provide a food and, and shelter and clothing for your family. But think about that game that you missed. They played in a remarkable game. And you don't know that you're ever going to get those opportunities again. I think about with my younger son um, coaching basketball. I know you had mentioned about championship coach. As a, as a varsity basketball coach, my son was one of the um, starters on the team. We made it for the school. We made it to the CIF championship game. And it was the first time in the school's 100-year history that the boys basketball team had made it to CIF championship game. And so that was a big game. And we ended up winning. Not only did we win, but my son played probably one of the best games of his life. He shot six three-pointers. He had a couple baskets going up for layups. He was just a beast out on the court. And to be able to have that experience with him, not only as a coach, but as a dad, because I was still watching as a dad, but being a coach on his team, we both now have CIF championship rings. They're like Super Bowl style rings that we will have forever together. Yeah. And it's because I took the time and was intentional with my time with him that we'll be able to have those memories forever. Um, if I was committed to just working in a career and focusing on making money for my family so much that I missed those opportunities, I would regret it. And it's something you can't get back. You can't rewind time. So time is, um, is something that I hear a lot from dads. And a lot of dads admit on my show that they have to focus on that. They have to be more aware of is their time with their kids. Yeah, I love it. And having that shared moment is something you, you and your son can talk about for forever. You know, you can talk about mm -hmm. it and reminisce about that where you, if, you, if you're not there because you're, you're working or, or whatever. And as you said, you know, we do have to work to provide for our families. But if you don't really need to be in that meeting or make that sale, it's, it's an amazing thing to be there and share that experience. But also if things don't go well and your kids maybe have a terrible game or they get injured or they need that consoling from a father afterwards as well. Um, mm -hmm. It's another hugely important thing to do and be there for them as well. Yeah. The, I hear a lot of parents say, well, that's great that you had that opportunity, Brian. I just don't have that opportunity. I have to work. My work doesn't allow me that opportunity to do those things. 
And I hear that and I respect that. I, I understand that. Maybe you can't be at every single game, but at least be at the games that you can be at for sure. Mm -hmm. um, for me, when I got into my career, I laid it down in front of them in the very beginning. I said, this is what I plan on doing. Is this going to be workable for you? And if it wasn't, Simon, I'll be honest, if they told me, no, you have to be here, you can't do those things, I would have quit. Mm -hmm. I would have said, you know what, there's a million other jobs out there, I'll go somewhere else. But they didn't, they were very flexible with me. But I was very aware of my time with my business, with my company that I worked with. There were times where I had to get up and go into the office at 4 a.m. so I could leave at 2 to go to a game. So I was very aware of my time with them. They were willing to work with me. So I was going to work with them. So I lost maybe an hour or two of sleep to be able to be in the office so I could leave and be, be there for my kids when they needed me. So I just made those sacrifices. And those, those are things that, that parents can try to work through, kind of find out what ways that they can, they can sacrifice different areas of their time to be there for their kids and still be there for their job. We've been fortunate, I guess, one of the positive things that's come out of COVID, for example, is that particularly in Australia, we've done a lot more remote working, a lot more online stuff where we can work from home and balance family life a little bit more easy. Has that been the same case over in the US? Have you been able to work more remotely since COVID? Yeah, I mean, that's been a huge addition to our company. Um, I have a staff of eight people and um, I still have them on what we call a hybrid schedule right now. So they come in the office three days a week and then they're home two days a week. I have one, one gal that has two younger kids at home and she's a single lady. Um, she has no family in California, so she's by herself. So I've allowed her a little bit more flexibility to work from home, but I'm also not a babysitter for them. So mm -hmm. I've told them, I'm not going to micromanage you. If you're getting your job done at home, then I'm fine with it. And you can work as home as, mu as much as you need to. Um, there have been times where I've needed to work remote for whatever reason, and I have that flexibility. Now I'm a manager, so I have a little bit more flexibility than they might. Yeah, it certainly helped in a lot of family cases. What I'm seeing now is after COVID, we've we've opened up and we're not locked down anymore. We had I mean, in Australia, we had lots of lockdowns, and people actually liking to go back to the office for that reconnection with people mm -hmm. that they work with and and building those relationships up again as well. When COVID first hit, I went into the office every day but I kept my staff at 100% remote for quite a while. And then I slowly incorporated them into one day a week in the office, four days at home, and then two, and now mm. we're up to three right now. So um, it's kind of been baby steps, but uh, yeah, we were 100% remote for a while. I went into the office because I prefer to be in the office. I feel like I can get more done there than being at home. Mm -hmm. um, but everybody else in my staff was 100% remote in the very beginning. Yeah. Now, Brian, I could talk fatherhood and family and, and work all day with you, but I appreciate that it's a Sunday over there and you probably need to get back to Sunday duties. All so good. All a, good. Couple, a couple more questions and I'll let you go. Thinking about your fatherhood journey and family journey, what's something that you know about yourself now that you wish you knew when you first started? Like what's something that sticks out to mind going, I wish I could just tell myself when I was starting as a dad, that this didn't matter or that didn't matter and, and, and things will be okay. Is there something that sticks out for you? Yeah. If it doesn't matter five years from now, it's not going to matter five minutes from now. Um, so one of the biggest things that I take away from my fatherhood journey now that I'm older and my kids are older is patience. I had to learn a lot of patience. Um, and that that came to me over years. Um, I was a very impatient guy. As a dad, I was very impatient. That is something that I wish I had when my boys were younger, a bit more patience with them mm -hmm. because I was, I was tough to deal with at times. Um, I was very impatient. And so you need dads out there, you know what, man, be patient. They're little, they're kids. They're just wanting to be kids. Um, so be patient with them. And, uh, yeah, it's like I said, if, it, if it's not going to matter five years from now, it doesn't matter five minutes from now. Yeah, like that. And I guess if you are struggling for patience, maybe go and coach a four-year-old sporting team. Right, right. Because <laughs> yeah. you'll need a bucket loads of patience for that. <laughs> right. Uh, and one more question is, is I always like to finish off and, and hearing my guests to plug something that makes you feel good. So it doesn't have to be anything to do with fatherhood or family or anything like that. It's just something that is giving you some good vibes at the moment that you can pass on to some of our audience so that they maybe can tune into a, some music or a book or a TV show that you're watching or a self-care activity as well. It doesn't have to be anything uh, material. It can be just something that you do for yourself. Yeah, um, I'm a big firm believer in journaling. I journal every single day. 
it's kind of grown on me over the years. I start it in the morning when I first get up because a lot of times in the morning when we first wake up, we are thinking about the stresses of the day already, thinking about what you have to do with the kids or your family or work. Uh, and I find that journaling kind of helps um, relieve that stress, gets everything that's on my mind out on paper so I can start the day fresh in my head. So yeah, I start off every day with journaling. I've had Friends of mine tell me that I should be journaling at night. I actually don't, but um, I've had them tell me that journaling at night too, like gratitude things, things that you've accomplished during the day that you're proud of. Um, so that's obviously something that's helpful. But for me, journaling is a huge part of my life. And right now I'm journaling throughout the day. So it's just a little thing that I do on my phone. Um, mm -hmm. doesn't take more than a, you know, 30 seconds to do. And I jot down throughout several times of the day, just different thoughts, how I'm feeling, how my mood is, the energy level that I have, those kind of things I jot down and what kind of things I've done for the day, uh, what I still have to do. So I've been doing that now for just a couple of weeks, just kind of I'm doing like this little 30, 30, 45 day challenge to myself. Journaling is a good thing for dads to get into. It's not, you're not writing in a diary. You're not doing any of that kind of um, goofy stuff. It's just to help you kind of get your minds right to start your day and get your day off on the right foot and kind of get your thoughts out on paper to kind of help you start fresh. That's kind of the way I see it. Um, and I know that, uh, you know, for you as a therapist, I mean, I know that a lot of people look at journaling as something important to mm. do, um, not keeping your thoughts bottled up because you never know when those are going to come out and how they're going to come out. So journaling is super important. So that's the, that would be the tip that I would suggest dads or moms take up is journaling yeah definitely and you're right the more we can get things out of our heads the the more we can clear space to think clearly but also disempower things that are you know maybe some negative thoughts that are going through your head like the things that are beating you down and and, and keeping you down and stuff like that so journaling is a great way yeah i love it um thanks so much for sharing that journaling and i love the tips around yeah. doing it throughout the day as well like it's a really mm -hmm. cool thing to do because whenever someone thinks about gratitude journaling for example like what am I grateful for at the end of the day? They, and I found this, we often regurgitate the same couple of things like family, you know, having a house, having a job. But when we can do it through the day, we can identify those small things that we do during mm -hmm. the day. It might be that cup of coffee with a friend. It might be this amazing podcast chat that we're having right now and or, or you know, getting the kids to school on time for the first time this week or what, and just the small right. things that make us feel good um, and can, you know, be a, a big tick for the day. Add on to what you said there. Because I like the kind of the what you said is like these little small wins that you have throughout mm -hmm. the day, right? Um, celebrate those small wins because the more you feel accomplished in those small wins, and the more small wins you stack on top of each other, the, the greater sense of accomplishment you'll feel. I mean, imagine those small wins after a week, all mm -hmm. those small wins stacked up, and then a month, and then six months, and then a year. Imagine where you'll be today. And where you'll be a year from now, just celebrating in those small wins that you had throughout the year. So Absolutely. celebrate those small wins. Yeah, definitely. Now, Brian, if we'll put the, the links in the show notes, but like, yeah, where's the best place for people to, to find you and, and see some more of your stuff or hear some more of your stuff? Yeah. Uh, Data podcast, pretty much everywhere. Um, YouTube, Apple, Spotify, all those different places. YouTube is data podcast. Um, the best place for them to reach me would be Instagram. That's data mm -hmm. podcast. Um, they can see my content there as well as uh, message me. It'll either be me or someone from my team that'll respond. Uh, but we always respond unless it's a weird comment. Or so yeah, data podcast on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm on uh, LinkedIn. I'm on TikTok. Um, yeah, all those different places. So Awesome. And yeah, we'll put the links in the show notes so people can easily access them as well. Um, but Brian, thanks so much for, for coming on the show. I really appreciate you taking some time out of your Sunday to, to have a chat with me. And I look forward to the episode coming out and, and hearing more about you, maybe catching up in the future to see how things are going. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you again, Simon. I really appreciate it. I'm glad we've gotten to know each other. Glad we've gotten to uh, a chance to uh, be social media friends and uh, virtual friends. One of these days, I'll have to take a trip over there and, and yeah. we'll have to uh, break bread together. Uh, but thank you very much for having me on the show, brother. I'm, I'm proud of what you're doing. Keep it up because it's needed. The things that you're doing right now, helping people and helping men in particular is needed. Um, so your, your work does not go unnoticed. Thank you. 
Well, that's a wrap for today's episode and I hope you got some value from it. If anything triggered your mental health today, please reach out to your support networks. Also, if you love what you heard, be sure to subscribe to the show and share it with your mates. For more from Mindful Men, you can check us out on Instagram and YouTube and I'll throw the links to these pages in the show notes below. But until next time, stay mindful.